Welcome back to all the Taking Inventory listeners. First off, we're sorry for taking a two week break, our first break ever. We've gotten one really angry email. I'm sorry, mom, we're back on air. James, why don't you share with listeners why we took a break? You know, we were celebrating something big. Uh, I think you made some announcements on LinkedIn, on X, but share it with the listeners. Yeah, we, we sold market. Couldn't be more excited about it. We were acquired by a Vera shop group who is just building some awesome tech for retailers and merchants. Their founders are two of the most impressive people I know. Kate Kahn, who spent almost a decade at Amazon as their SVP of retail. And then their chairman, Emron Khan, was the chief strategy officer at Snapchat. And he took Alibaba public prior to that. And you know they've raised over $140 million from just a, a whole slew of amazing investors. And so, uh, yeah, took a little break after closing the deal. I am super excited about what Verishop is building. I've joined as an advisor, helping them integrate our AI tech and um, extremely excited for everyone to see what they're going to bring to market uh, over the next you know few weeks. But we are back. Yeah. So post close uh, of the deal, Dan and I were just talking about like what would be a great episode to come back with. And um, very excited that Connor McKenna, a partner at Luma Partners, who was one of our first guests ever, came back on the pod and is walking us through his take on the state of the M&A markets uh, across ad tech, martech, uh, and the economy in general. Yeah, it's hard to find someone with a better perspective than Connor, someone who's actually out in market talking with teams, talking with buyers, looking at the data. And so let's get into the episode with Connor and have him break it all down for us. Welcome back to another episode of Taking Inventory. This week, we are welcoming back Connor McKenna from Luma Partners to give us a state of play for M&A, transaction markets. Connor, welcome back to the podcast. So excited you're, you're returning. Thank you guys for having me back. Pleasure to be a repeat uh, repeat podcaster here. Yeah, we, we reserve that right for, for a select few. Uh, but why don't we start off from your point of view and, and what you've seen throughout the year, what happened in 24 as far as financing M&A markets? Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're far from 24 being over yet, right? We're, we're not even into uh, September, so the end of Q3 and, and, and Q4 coming. Um, you know, where there's often a, a lot of M and A activity, a little wrinkle with with a, you know, slightly important uh, presidential election uh, in the middle of that. But um, already, look, twenty four like M and A is back, and, and especially M and A is back in comparison to you know twenty two and twenty three, which is not a hard comp uh, to be against, right? Because those were effect- effectively a decade long low uh, in M and A activity, and in particular in the tech markets and ad tech and martech, where we really spend time. Um, you know, was just a, a business as, as relates to to deal activity um, in those sectors. You know, a large part of that was, frankly, you know, 22, 23, as interest rates started going up, there was expected recession for, you know, what's it been now, almost 10 quarters of expected recession. Um, and so companies really started focusing on, on turning inward, right? They went from this exuberance of low interest rates growth at all costs to a quick pivot to, oh crap, we need to make sure we've got our house in order. And that took a long time. And especially the amount of time, given the uncertainty and constant expectation of, you know, inflation and interest rates and add some, you know, global unrest to that um, uh, was more extended than we've seen in, in prior situations, which led to, you know, a year plus um, uh, reset around M&A activity. As we came into 24, We've definitely seen that pick back up where, where people are gearing into conversations. Kind of last Thanksgiving, start of the year is where we started seeing those really begin to pick up. People find the confidence to, to do M&A, which is a huge part of this. Um, and already this year, I was just looking at the numbers in, in ad tech and martech you know, through year to date. So not even through Q3, we've already surpassed the total number of deals, both total deals and scale deals, which we define as over 100 million. Um, uh, in these sectors, uh, you know, year to date. So like by far and away in a, in a stronger footing than we were. I think at a broad picture, the way we would sort of define it or think about it is 24 is better. It's not great. Um, the the types of deals are, are when we can get into this, you know, a little bit more consolidation and, and cleanup. But 23 was all about survival, right? 
people had to react to the changes. They had to focus on on keeping their companies intact. They had to focus on shifting to profitability. Um, it was very inward focus. Very little M and A deals to get done. Twenty four was more of a revival period, right? So there's uh, deals are happening. Uh, but people are still getting comfortable where they are. 25 and, and beyond is where we see, you know, sort of like survive, revive, thrive. And, um, you know, where we see a lot more lean in, especially towards more of the strategic deals, right? Where you really have to be more forward leaning, forward thinking um, about the opportunity. And again, it, it's all about confidence, right? M&A and making these big bets are about confidence. It's what you expect the future to be. If you don't have that confidence, it's very hard to, to lean into those, you know, Call larger multiple or more forward uh, forward projecting uh, types of transactions. Is it like for when you're talking to potential buyers, like can you sense the confidence is coming back? And if if so, do, does a buyer start to look at this as an opportunity, like an arbitrage opportunity on the multiple? To like, you know, you're trying to you know kind of beat the the rest of the the field to get a deal in, or or when that starts happening, that means the confidence is back. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the type of buyer, right? You know, private equity in many ways is, is you know, the entry price is so important to what their, you know, their exits, uh, ultimate exit will be. And there have been a lot of people fishing for deals, but interest rates have been so high that, you know, leveraging with debt has been a challenge. So the deals they want to pay were so low that there were tons of processes that we were aware of that were, you know, called broken processes where people went to market, talked to a ton of uh, a ton of buyers. There was a lot of general interest, but general interest at very low valuations to the point where you know entrepreneurs and boards are not wanting to transact. So there's a there's a delicate balance there. I think that was 23 for sure. 24, we started to see you know a little bit more alignment. You know some of those prices came down. Some of the the platforms grew into you know better maybe not better multiples, but better absolute numbers that made it um, made things more attractive. For strategics, especially in, in this space, in ad tech and martech, where things change so quickly, entry multiple is certainly important. People are going to be thoughtful about it, but it's very important about who you're buying and what you're buying. If you're just buying EBITDA and, a, and another arm of business, then yeah, entry multiple is going to be the focus. If you're buying technology and a, and a future you know, product or capability, it, the focus is much more on the right company. I think the challenge is there hasn't been a lot of that focus on your willingness to jump into, you know, let's go buy into this new product line. Let's go create this new part of our business. Let's really expand. It's been about, you know, driving efficiency in, in core, um, in core businesses. What I'd say is from a confidence perspective, I mean, look with interest rates expected to go down soon, that drives some confidence into private equity. I think in general, we've seen them get more comfortable with where the world is. For strategic buyers, some of my signal on confidence is um, the specificity of conversations we are having. So a year ago, I would call up, you know, buyers, or they'd call us, and just, you know, tell us what's going on in the market, what's happening, what are we seeing. I mean, kind of this conversation, right? Not a lot of specificity. As it shifts to, can you talk to me about performance CTV and who does what and why are they winning this part? Like, you start to get a lot more signal as to okay, they're leaning in specifically on this capability, this opportunity, there's a strategy behind it. Those conversations really picked up this year uh, in a variety of different you know, avenues and, and capabilities. And within that, are, the, are there certain sectors that you're finding that you're getting more interest or questions about than maybe you did in 22, 23? Like are, are you starting to see a shift in what buyers are interested in from a tech or a team perspective? I don't know that they're they're completely different, right? If you think about ad tech, um, I you know there's different buckets of where there's a lot of interest. Obviously, CTV has been a huge topic for five years now, and it continues to be a big area of focus. As you know, all the platforms that were subscription are now all have advertising arms. They need to think about the technology they they own uh, and and leverage. Commerce media continues to grow in its in its um, uh, you know expansion and maybe take it you know commerce media, everything's an ad network, whatever it is. So many different new entrants are entering the advertising ecosystem more broadly speaking. That is, you know, creating a lot of questions about what that technology looks like, what's needed, what, in, what do intermediaries need to own, what can platforms own themselves. So 
that's been a big topic of conversation. I think it's only gotten more um, progressed as the you know scale of commerce media has gotten that much larger, especially outside of just you know Amazon, Walmart, and, and a few of the top top three. Uh, data and identity is a constant conversation, and you know, given Google's regular changes as to when they were going to deprecate cookies and now how they're going to deprecate cookies, you know, is an ongoing. Uh, you know, question mark. And that's the type of question mark that makes it very hard for people to do M&A, frankly, but is a critical perspective on, you know, where do you think the market's going and what happens and, and what winners and losers shake out of those types of changes. So uh, those are probably the biggest themes as it relates to ad tech. I guess the one other I'd add is uh, the creator ecosystem, which is an area we're spending a lot of time on. I think what's what's interesting there is certainly there's eyeballs and attention and that's an advertising aspect, but you also have creators now think really treating themselves as businesses. And that creates a marketing automation and a marketing technology uh, opportunity. And we're starting to see some more companies picking up on, on that fact as well. You, know, you mentioned the, um, you know, mentioned Google and, you know, obviously they're the financial cookies, but also just, you know, now this kind of overhang of um, antitrust. Do you have a point of view, like if, if, or have you seen in the past, like if they were to be forced to broken broken up in some way, shape, or manner, right? Like, do you think that sets off kind of a new wave of M and A across the space? Just because, like, there will be, in theory, there should be new opportunities that stem from that. I don't know if there's like a historical pattern when these things happen or not. But I was just kind of curious. I think they're a little bespoke to. Um... To, to each individual situation, especially as it relates to m and I mean, it certainly drives a lot more competition into the space. I mean, and the challenge with Google is like, what does a breakup mean? There's probably, you know, ask five different people and there's five different breakup scenarios that you could, uh, you could talk about um, in that space, even within just their ad tech assets that are off network, you could say, do they hold on to demand? Do they hold on to the, you know, double click? Do they spin the whole thing? Like it, it, even that's a, an open question mark. Um, no matter what, I think it does, you know, it's the biggest player out there. Um, let's just take the ad network off platform search, relieve YouTube search ads um, separate for now. It's the biggest, you know, uh, advertising intermediary uh, in the omnichannel ecosystem. Day one, that creates a lot more competition in the space, a lot more opportunities for people to, to play in. And, you know, I think still brings opportunities for there to be scale. I think it probably, I don't know that it immediately offsets M&A in that space. Um, you're already seeing a lot of consolidation around SSPs and DSPs and, and others, but uh, it probably makes a new acquirer out of that business, frankly. Nice. Like Google yeah. hasn't been allowed to acquire something in ad tech in a long time, given the you know antitrust concerns that they've got. So it, it will change the landscape dramatically. It will, I think, have big impacts on a lot of businesses in this space that are already at, at a decent amount of scale that can accelerate off it. And you could see them then leaning more into M&A versus, you know, um, sort of sitting on their back foot today and, and, you know, instead leaning forward into growth, leaning forward into opportunity that they just don't have the capacity to do uh, at this moment. And, you know, for, for someone like Google, like when you, I don't know if you can share, <laughs> share this, but when you talk to like a Google or a Meta and, you know, can you tell they're like, listen, like, I'd love to do a deal. But like, I just can't. I'm like, not a lot. Is, is, are they right now, is the lack of confidence in their ability to get a deal done kind of at an all-time low, regardless of the fact that the market in general is getting confident? Yeah, you don't call them. I mean, I, Google doesn't get a call on most ad tech deals because they couldn't do it. I mean, I... I and I think everyone knows that. And I mean, I'm sure they get calls. There's no way they don't. But yeah, they'll, I mean, if there's a situation where they're, you know, sure, the technology could be interesting, but we're going to get so much pressure on this. That it's certainly part of the calculus in deciding what to look at and where to spend their time on. Now, you know, they can do, there are deals they can do or will try to do. And obviously there were rumors about, you know, Google buying HubSpot earlier this year. So they're still thinking about big opportunities. Would that, in that calculus, I guarantee there was an antitrust calculus um, and consideration that yes, we could, uh, you know, we could get past it. Um, but I think for a lot of, you know, if you were selling an SSP today, could you go call Google? No, like they're not going to, I, one, I don't think they, they probably need it, but two, yeah. uh, why would they take that risk? So get a job, corp dev, Google. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, outside of, I mean, just the regulatory concerns. I mean, you mentioned it earlier in the conversation, but we are you know, entering a, a few months presidential election. And so what does that calculus look like? from an administrative perspective, you know, which administration comes in, what their policies are on certain sectors, what the policies may be for the economy as a whole, right? Of, of either stimulating the economy, putting pressure on the Fed, whatever it may be. Like, what is your framework or folks in the industry, what, what is the framework to evaluate that risk? Yeah, I think there's a lot in there. So let me maybe focus on the, the antitrust component to start. I think, uh, the antitrust hammer has been, you know, antitrust is good uh, within reason. I think the hammer has has gone too broad and has stimmed too much of challenge around M and A that is like putting a blanket over tech M and A more broadly than it needs to. Um, certainly, you know, there's pressure against the largest digital giants that you know have at this point like deemed a monopoly in certain aspects of their business and, you know, having antitrust manage against that very healthy, good for the startup economy, startup ecosystem overall. And, and I think for our economy to have a vibrant technology innovation uh, ecosystem, the the challenge is it's, it's gone so broad that even much smaller players and much smaller deals, there's so much scrutiny and concern that it might the Lena Khan and, and the FTC might come after this deal that it's actually put a you know a damper on a broader swath and that's not healthy. I think the expectation is you know some of that is going to come down. You know certainly if uh, you know the parties change here, there's a broader expectation. Big tech still seems to be under the you know uh, is a is not a friend to either party for different reasons. So I'd expect them to continue to have pressure sort of no matter what. I think an ideal situation is that there's, and really, I think either party should be leaning into this, is making it easier for, uh, you know, the mid-tier platforms to be able to do M&A because it's an important part of, of this ecosystem. It's an important part of how we've driven innovation in this country over the last few decades, if, if, you know, and, and much longer. And so, uh, you know, hopefully there's some more rationality and, and uh, reasonableness, uh, you know, approach to this. Um, but it's tough. Like, should Amazon be able to buy a, a vacuum company? Probably. And, but it's just, it's Amazon. So it's going to come under so much scrutiny that, that it has to, you know, uh, have that challenge. So definitely things we're paying attention to. I think in our space today, it it's mostly impacts the biggest players. Um, what's very interesting in the advertising space is, you know, we've had this concept of like ad tech is eating the world. I mean, there's more platforms and companies focused on driving a new advertising business than I've ever seen before, right? And thinking about how to use their data and their consumer interactions to get involved in advertising versus only being a media property where it's all about scale of consumers and the time spent on your platform. Now it's, you know, the scale of your consumers and the intense signals you get or the uh, transactions that you see or um, a different form of, you know, time and attention and how it can be leveraged. And so that creates a whole new swath of potential buyers, um, potential partners uh, that, you know, really drives scale and opportunity into this space that don't have the same scrutiny that, you know, the, the mega hyperscalers do, um, you know, in the media ecosystem. So Interesting. And, you know, I guess along with the election, you know, the other kind of big macro thing, you know, is I guess the, the assumption that, that rates are going to get cut. It feels like that's like pretty, pretty locked in, but What's your take on, I guess, yeah, like just in general, lower rates and like what that do for the space, and and what if there is a recession and lower rates, does that still slow down things? Like, are 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 lower rates for a reason a bad thing, or or does it lead to activity regardless? Yeah, it's a it's a you know it's a tough macro question in general. I mean, look. <laughs> The reason rates haven't lowered already is because there was too much job growth, right? <laughs> there was too much strength. Like the the point of keeping rates high was to uh, actually slow things down, and so you know naturally that that does create um, concern for there to be you know recession here. It, this is an interesting period where 
we've been expecting this recession for so long that there's a lot of this like hard work that you might need to do, especially from a company corporate perspective in a recession has been done. Obviously, you know, if consumer spending drops off a cliff or, you know, that impacts expected advertising dollars and how much people are going to spend in. So it, it flows through this ecosystem. But at the same time, like con- the other consumer usage habits have been changing and people have been sitting on the sidelines for so long that there's still appetite and cash, frankly, ready to go in it and invest into, you know, accelerated growth. So I, I think it has, you know, certainly it has an impact on ad dollars if we move into a, a recession. You know, the big question there is the depth um, and length of it, right? Like how how drastic is it and how long is it? It doesn't feel like if we move into a recession, um, given we've almost acted like it and consumer sentiment has, has has felt like it's in a recession for the last year and a half that um you know that it, it's it's a little more structural than you know maybe you know endemic to the to the challenge and so or, or like the length may not be as long so i think it's going to impact it it's a it's a big unknown unknown people are sort of pushing through at this point i, I don't think it really shifts the uh, need for especially this ecosystem to start, frankly, leveraging the cash on people's balance sheets to go and find their next avenues of growth because being a 5 10% grower is not a, a, a strong place to be in, with an ecosystem that's growing 20 plus percent still year over year uh, in digital advertising. And, and you, know, you see companies trying to figure out where they can find new avenues and, and go after those opportunities. You know, once once companies do find those opportunities, or once there is a shift in the markets or a perceived shift, how fast do companies react? Typically, like, is it pretty swift, or is there a lag of several months or quarters before that confidence is built back up to actually start to to invest in the market? It's it's highly dependent. Uh, generally slow. I mean, or it's already happening, right? Like, again. We're, we moved from that, hey, talk to me just what's happening in the markets to, hey, talk to me about this type of you know demand platform or this part of commerce media um, and how could it, we could leverage it inside of our businesses. So that that's already happening. If you're not at that stage, then yeah, you're going to be slow because you have to go build your strategy to then decide what to buy, right? Um, it, it, reactive m a is is not a very productive you know avenue right (laughs) like people do it but it's it's much better to be proactive um especially in this space right technology lemmings is not a does not have a great track record where you see you know one company buys something so a a big platform goes in and buys the next one I, i mean i think we've been riddled with examples of you know companies that bought something for a billion plus going to, right down to zero like a you know salesforce buddy media or you know apple aquanib or you know one of those ones where they they decided they need something they reacted too fast and 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 bought it now look i'll sell them it i'm a banker so if they want to do it you know we're, <laughs> we're, we're game but uh but i think in general um the people that are buying first are doing it proactively, right? They've already decided that, that strategy. What what occurs or what can occur is that if the like the public markets start rewarding people for for action and strategy and and moving, then you'll see the other other people become lemmings and really move in and accelerate their timelines and just get things done. And that very much happened in in twenty one, right? Twenty twenty, we had COVID. Things went quiet for six seven months. By Q4 of 2020, all of a sudden deals came back. People started going public. In the first half of 21, M&A was ripping. And we had deals where it went from you know first conversation to execution in 30 days. That's pretty rare. But at the time, closing a deal, you could your public market could jump, or the value of a company could jump more than the deal you just priced on the day of announcement. And so companies were taking huge risks and moving incredibly quickly. I don't think we're like running back to that anytime soon. I, I, we're, we're still sort of dealing with the challenges of, of, of that exuberance uh, now, frankly. So it's not going to, th- that's why it's, you know, survive in 23, revive in 24 and, and more survive and thrive in 25, right? It's It's been this progression back towards what is the strategy? Where do we have comparative advantage? How do we go and execute this? And it's just been a step function of, you know, more aggressive bets and more, you know, confidence in, into the, where the future's headed. 
it, you know, when, when you think about like the publicly traded companies, um, you know, obviously like, you know, for, for better or worse, you know, we, we spent a lot of time at Snap and we, we follow the stock closely. And like, you know, you definitely have seen post COVID this divergence, at least in relative valuations for a lot of the, the publicly traded companies. You can look at like, obviously a Snap to a Meta, you can look at Lyft and Uber. Does, does seeing sort of like these companies that potentially could be undervalued, um, like seeing kind of that that kind of exists in the ecosystem make you think like if there is like significant rate cuts and there's some more exuberance coming back that like those types of companies become pretty inquisitive, like they kind of get back to their old ways or, or we we're like kind of never going back to like, you know, these sort of subscale companies buying up, you know, companies left and right. Like Lyft has a long history of being really acquisitive, but if you look at the relative market cap of Uber, it, 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 they've kind of lost. Right. Or it feels that way. But, you know, is that a function of, you know, people, public markets don't want to invest in things that, you know, aren't for sure because you can make so much money off interest rates or, you know, I don't know, just like what happens to these guys who kind of got left behind post post COVID? Do you think they start if rates are lower, they kind of get revived and start buying things up or, or who knows? I don't know that like rates is necessarily the the distinctive component there. I mean, lowering rates should have, you know, tends to drive more value into higher growth businesses. The challenges with a lot of these businesses, they've lost a lot of their growth over the last, uh, you know, couple of years. If you look at the MarTech ecosystem, you know, the average growth is, uh, what is it right now? You know, 10, 12%, same thing with ad tech. Um, so, you know, they, they want lower rates to drive, you know, more investment into technology. And so they can start driving more growth into their businesses. If they have confidence in that, and then there's new avenues for products and investments that they expect people to buy and spend on, that's, what's going to drive them to do more M and A. I think, you know, some of these there's, again, I don't know that it's rates driven, but, um, you have a lot, I take the MarTech ecosystem, if you look up, you know, marketing automation or customer journey, there's 40 companies that if you go to their website, it's very hard to distinguish who does what and and what part of the ecosystem. And there's a bunch of businesses that are public or private have raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars um, that are constantly bumping into each other. I mean, I think there's some natural role for consolidation in, in some of those ecosystems. Lowering rates helps do that with, you know, financial leverage and, and financial structuring as well. So that could certainly be an, an impact there. As it relates to, you know, call it the 10 to $20 billion businesses getting more acquisitive, I, I think it's more a function of confidence and, um, and acceleration, right? When you're growing 30 or 50% and you're constantly needing to, and that's what you're being judged on, find new products to scale and maintain that people start moving pretty quickly and, and buying lot, lots of lots of smaller things. Um, I think they need to find that confidence again. Right now, the scrutiny is really high. If you're growing at 10% and you're going to go buy something that's really attractive, you know, if they have enough leverage, you have to buy that at a very high multiple. It's hard to get those done uh, unless you have a lot of confidence that this is, you know, the key, right, to go to go change the the platform. So, if, I, I'd say it's a little bit more of like a, if, if the lower rates lead to that higher growth engine that they can see, then they, they've got the ability to go, you know, make those bets. And, and in that kind of scenario, do you see that like markets sometimes force organizations down a path, like a little bit of like tail wagging the dog? I think, you know, the past couple quarters, every earnings call, people were counting how many times CEO said AI or machine learning, you know, that just be kind of became the new thing. And so like, are you finding that like the market can actually push companies to be more acquisitive into certain sectors? Like if they know AI, they're going to get rewarded for some kind of AI announcement, they're going to go try to find an AI acquisition or it can be something other than AI, but that one's just obviously so so top of mind. No, no, it certainly does. I mean, I think these are. I, I think the the framing maybe makes it seem as if like investors' opinions of what they should do is the is the reason behind that. But it, that comes like as if there's not a, a, a further rationale behind it, which is the fact that that's where there's a lot of growth and opportunity, right? So AI is one where people 
you know, especially, you know, six, 12 months ago, we're really feeling like this is the complete game changer. There's going to be a massive shift um, of, you know, how consumers are using digital in, in completely different ways um, and could drive a huge amount of value to our companies, whether it's through efficiency or growth, right? So both uh, top line and, and bottom line. Um, you know, right now where I think we're at like the point of the AI cycle where people are like saying, show me the money, right? So like what what's the outcome of all this spend, you know, for the hyperscalers into GPUs and for others, um, but certainly that drives it. I think in this space, you know, you saw this five years ago with CTV. Everyone, you know, went from talking about, uh, you know, general programmatic to they had to have a CTV story. Right now, everyone has to have a commerce media story. And so they're all moving into those areas, trying to find their lane because that's whatever is the fastest growing part of an ecosystem everyone wants to be a part of, right? So Certainly that draws people in and that draws attention to, you know, where there's M&A opportunities um, and, and where there'll be focus. So, but it has to be backed up by, you know, growth and revenue and, and actual numbers. Um, I think AI, that's been probably the biggest challenge, right, is where can we find that? And so you're seeing, you know, the biggest players do these, call them reverse aqua hires, where they're sort of like buying the team and licensing the tech. Uh, and then you're seeing, you know, some, uh, you know, I talked before about sort of the two worlds of M&A. There's like consolidation and cleanup deals. And we've seen a lot of that in the ad tech space of late where businesses that were, you know, the, the you know, fifth, DS, fifth SSP or had this, you know, capability with good EBITDA just consolidating together, you know, um, these are not going to be huge multiple deals. And then you see the more strategic ones are very small, right? Like a Reddit bought memorable AI, um, you know, early in their life cycle, for, you know, trying to buy them before they could, you know, really drive a ton of revenue off that. Um, so I think you'll see, you know, those types of deals when it comes to AI, it's really about the team. It's about technology. It's a lot less about buying revenue um, right now. But, uh, you know, I, I think those are, but certainly, yeah, I mean, the, the markets drive it and people want to have a story around it. And, and the more important that story is, you know, <laughs> they'll lean into it. It drives a little bit of that lemming factor for sure. Uh, but I think it's all because that's where the growth is. I, the, the challenge is you get a lot of companies that think they have to have that story, but they don't have a real like comparative advantage to enter. And, uh, you know, I think that's where you see um, maybe m and go wrong or, or just, you know, challenges in general. So I guess maybe that's a good segue for, for kind of what your predictions are, let's call it like for 25. Yeah. Do you think, do you think this starts to heat up? Is the AI wave kind of like get through the, uh, the show me stage into like, this is for real. Like what, what's Luma's take on, or maybe your take uh, on uh, the next 18 months? Yeah, I think, um, let's see. I think in the next 18 months, I think, well, I think we're going to see interest rates start to come down, which is going to you know, ideally lead to some reacceleration of growth in this space overall. Uh, if I were to make a, a couple predictions, I think you'll see a big, big acquisition from someone that is like non-traditional ad tech buyer um, in this space. So we've seen different waves of this where, where someone came out of the you know, woodworks and, and, and did a pretty sizable deal moving into this space. I think you'll see... Uh, definitely something around there. I, th you know, commerce media is going to continue to play a big role. I think we've yet to see. We've seen a couple deals that they've been a little more agency oriented, um, at least of of late. I think you'll see more true technology acquisitions uh, happen in that space, um, and then I think you're going to see some consolidation in the Martech ecosystem. I think there's going to be some big players that uh, you know lean into consolidation opportunity look for scale um, and, and comprehensive nature of their you know, business and sort of do classic, like, you know, put our teams together, cut out some costs, um, have more efficiencies um, and, and, you know, cut down some of the breadth of the competition right now. Cause it's, you know, again, like, you know, 35 companies that do the same thing, at least uh, on paper. Wow. Okay. Connor, those are some pretty fun ones. I can't wait to read one of Luma's market reports where uh, you guys wrap that up and we see what of this came true. 
you know, we're working on it. I, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have to <laughs> have to push these into existence, yeah, right? I don't want to up for the hearse in the conversation, <laughs> but once once they come to fruition, we're gonna bring you back on and hear uh, hear the 2020 version of it. There you um, go. The third timer, you get like a sport right. coat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, right? <laughs> um, all right, Connor. Before we let you go, if somebody wants to learn more about everything you've talked about this episode, has a company they want to get your input on. If they want to learn more about the industry, where can they either get in contact with you or learn more about Luma and get in contact with Luma? And I know we did this the first time you were on, but it's been a while, so I uh, want to refresh everyone's memories. Yeah, I, you know, certainly our website's got a lot of content on it. We publish, you know, our state of digital and other things. All that's on our website at LumaPartners.com. Um, we put out a quarterly report where we benchmark all the ad tech and, and martech public companies and, and all the m a in the space so would highly recommend that i think you can sign up for our newsletter that that has that somewhere um for me i'm on uh linkedin and and twitter at connor j mckenna 12 at twitter or x whatever <laughs> whatever we call it now um <laughs> i am uh, i'm active at times and then and then sparingly inactive so yeah those are the best places to find me. if you have you know if you really want to talk just reach out. People can email me. I'm cmckenna at lumapartners.com and um, always happy to talk to people about this ecosystem, where there's opportunities, what they should be thinking about. Um, you know, it's, you can look at it broadly. And, and I think when we, we created our Lumascapes, we used to say, you know, complexity is free, but transparency has a price. So if you want to uh, go deeper, you know, to really think about ad tech, you have to make it pretty bespoke because uh, things change so fast in this space. Um, that if it's not, you know, geared towards what your assets are, what your capabilities are and specific strategies, uh, there's just a lot of room for, for error in this ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, you guys have a pretty good track record. Uh, so definitely get in touch if, if any of that resonates uh, with listeners. And I think we'll see you or hopefully we'll see you at the next, uh, the next conference. Um, we normally see you making the rounds just like we are, just like everyone else in the industry. So hopefully we'll see you there. Yeah, look forward to seeing you guys in person again. Thank you for having me.